We are kicking off a new series today that we're calling Running on Empty. And before we uh, get into it, it is fall officially at Adventure Church. I know it's not fall season wise, but it just means that uh, school's back. So many of you are coming back to church, which is great. Our attendance drops 30% as soon as school gets back and comes back immediately on the first few weeks of school, which is a good thing. But as you can see, look around. You're sitting really close to some people, right? Parking lot's full. Our kids' workers are pulling their hair out right now uh, because there's twice as many people at this service. Uh, Last week we had about 600 people and almost 300 of them at 10. And so uh, if you can, uh, you can come to 8.30. Uh, You can come to 11.45. Um, and the statistics for us, 80% of our first-time guests come to this service, um, right? Because it's the service that everyone loves. Uh, but if you can help us out as we get into fall, uh, there's a lot more space and room, and you can maneuver in and out a lot easier, and uh, you only got to do it for a few months, and then we're going to move into a new building, and guess what? 10 o'clock won't even exist. We're not having a 10 o'clock service, so just get over it now, right? Just get over it. So it's good to see you. It's good to get back to our normal routine if we can consider anything normal after what we've been through. The last two and a half years, here we are in really our first fall as a church, as a society, that things are really kind of back to to normal, right? And we're kind of back into a new normal maybe for some of you. Maybe you don't go back to the office as much or you're working from home still or there's new routines that the pandemic kind of created, maybe not all of them bad, but definitely uh, life-altering what we've been through the last two and a half years. And what uh, I'm noticing and what really we're seeing in society in general is that uh, we're kind of back to normal, but the impacts of this pandemic have taken a toll on us, on you. Maybe you don't even realize it, or maybe you're fully aware of that, but When we face crisis, we're kind of hardwired by God to survive. Uh, We have this primal drive that's within us that enables us to overcome difficult situations, that gives us resiliency. I remember when Riley was first born, we have a newborn, she's five weeks old, she had a congenital heart defect that required open heart surgery. It was a very uh, challenging situation as our new parents and you know, just navigating that, and as parents would, you know, come up to us and go, wow, I just, I can't even imagine. I, I can't imagine what it would be like to go through something like that, to, to do that. I don't know that I could do it. And I say, listen, you do what you got to do, right? We know that. Like, I didn't want to deal with it, but I could, and, and God has a way, and, and he does, provides grace when we need it. God doesn't give you more grace than you need, but when you face a situation, he has grace that's available to you that enables you to get through it. That's what he does. He's a good God. But we're resilient people. My daughter's resilient. She came through a lot. She has this determination that I think she needed to have when she was born to to, to get through some of the hurdles she had. I call it stubbornness today, but I try to remind myself that it's a strength that I need to help her harness and control. But, But we're resilient people. We we have this survival instinct and when we face difficult things, we, we rally, and, and then we rally again, and what can happen is, is that there's so many things that we face that kind of get piled up, and this pandemic, you know, kind of brought us through a very difficult situation that if we're not careful, we rally and we rally, and then we discover there's nothing left. The reserves, really, of our soul, of our life, get depleted, and and we're seeing this happen in in our world to where people just say, I'm done. I don't want to do it anymore. And we can kind of just unexpectedly collapse into discouragement, depression. And I I think maybe even a better way to describe it is, is just a numbness of our soul, where we just find ourselves just going through the routine. We become very robotic in our lives and in our relationships, and it's just, we're surviving. We're just going through the motions, trying to make it, trying to get through another day, trying to survive, 
And can I tell you something that God never intended for you to live your life like that? God doesn't want you to run on empty. There's a graphic they're going to pop up, and when you see this graphic, there's really kind of two types of people, right? There's someone who sees that and goes, oh, I got plenty of time left. I'm going to Costco in three days. Their gas is cheaper. I'll just fill up when I get there, right? And then there's some of you that even if it gets to a quarter of a tank, you're like, I got to find that. Hey, Siri, where's the closest gas station, right? Like, I, I, I don't care how much it is. I got to fill up now. I could run out of fuel at any moment, right? And if you have a newer car, right, it tells you, like, how many miles are left, the range left, range of miles to go, right? And it'll say, hey, you have 50 miles left until you're going to be out of fuel, fill up soon, right? And we get these indicators and, and warning signs and lights that kind of say, hey, you're running low. You're running low. You need to stop soon and fill up. And it's fine to, for those of you who love to live life on the edge to push it to the limits, right? And let me just see. How many of you, just for fun, I guess you don't have to participate, how many of you have run out of gas before, right? See, those are those people right there, right? It's like, you're like, I, I've, nev I've never run out of gas, <laughs> you know? Uh, but we push it to the limit. But listen to me, when it comes to your life, you can't push your soul to the limit. It's not wise. Because here's the problem. It's kind of like you don't necessarily have the gauge on your soul that says you're on fumes here. I mean, some of you maybe feel it. But it's all of a sudden, typically burnout, crashes in life, there, there's sudden things that happen. And all of a sudden, we're at a place where we're stranded on the side of the road with no fuel in sight, not knowing what to do. Everything about the hour we're living in is pushing our souls to the limit. And, and we weren't exactly living the blessed, abundant balanced life before 2020 either, right? As a society, many of us came into this pandemic kind of worn out from the madness that our modern lives have created, addicted to technology, running at a speed and pace that you were never designed to operate at, then a global pandemic hit. And you were literally set up to be steamrolled by this pandemic, and it's taken its toll, right? the fear of death that we face, the unpredictability of what was going to happen with this virus and what was it going to do, bombarded with negative news, one of the most polarizing political uh, elections of our time happening, the, the social and racial tensions, the quarantines, the lockdowns, the repeated cycles of fear with no end in sight, and then a lot of what you enjoyed, a lot of what refilled your tank was immediately stripped from you. Close, shut down, done. Couldn't eat at your favorite restaurant. Couldn't go watch a movie. Couldn't go on vacation. Couldn't go where you wanted to go. Do the things that you normally do, right? I never, ever want to hear the word unprecedented ever again, right? How many of you hope whatever happens in the future, there's established precedent, right? This has happened before we know what to do, right? That was our world. That's what you were living in. And what counselors would tell you and doctors would tell you is what we experienced as a society is called trauma. It was very traumatic, right? I mean, when you really step back and you think it's traumatic, you don't feel it in the moment because you're wired to get through it. You rally, right? That's what you do. Your kids got sent home from school. You rallied. You did what you had to do, right? Your job went virtual, you, you rallied, you, you got laid off, things happened, you rally, you rally, you rally until you can't rally anymore. Because when you rally, you have to tap into reserves to rally. They're, they're not normal, it's not a normal thing, it's not a normal day. So you tap into a reserve tank and before you know it, the reserves are gone. And if you don't deal with trauma, I've learned through my own counseling, Trauma will eventually deal with you. Denial won't fix it. Oh, we're fine. We're fine. I'm fine. We're in I'm, I'm fine. I'm good. Denial won't fix it. You need a plan. Getting back to normal, which most of us have, 
gotten back to in a sense, again, maybe new in some ways, won't work because normal wasn't working before the pandemic. So what do we do? How do we refuel our lives? And in this series, that's what we're going to talk about. How can we practically seek the source that truly satisfies our souls? What does that look like? Because the good news is that we always have hope. Jesus has been, always will be our hope. Jesus came, he said, to give you life and life to the full. Jesus doesn't want you running on empty. Because of Jesus, you don't have to run on empty. There's practical tools, there's things that you can do, there's things that you can apply to your life that make sure that the reserve tanks are always ready to go, that there's strength and resilience that's available to you to live out the purpose and calling that God has for your life. You don't have to run on empty, amen? You don't have to, but you gotta seek the source. You gotta seek the source. Look at your neighbor and say, seek the source. Seek the source of supernatural strength. Listen to me. Supernatural strength. It's not natural, the strength that God can provide you. It's the strength that people saw in Jess and I as we navigated an open heart surgery with our daughter at five weeks old. I don't know how you do that. Well, it's not me, it's him. It's the strength of parents we have in our church right now that are walking their children through cancer. And I go, I can't imagine that supernatural strength. How many of you need some supernatural strength? You need some supernatural strength in your marriage because your strength isn't working anymore. You need some supernatural strength when it comes to your career and just the daily routine of your life because your strength isn't working anymore. You're running on empty. So you have to learn how to seek the right source. You see, we return to normal. The kids are back in school. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord, right? People are back to work. I saw this week Apple just announced that they're bringing people back to their billion dollar compound, you know? I'm sure the president's walking around going, this is a really nice place. We should put some people in it, right? (laughs) It's changing, right? They're they're finding out, like the virtual thing is great. Some of you get to enjoy some of that, but there's, there's, there's implications culturally to your team when you're not interacting face to face. Apple's finding that out, even though, uh, the num- financial numbers are good. The, the team morale is low. So let's get people back. And so we're getting back to normal. You're getting back to normal in a new normal, right? And it's like, it, and, and I don't know about you, but it seemed like it kind of just happened, right? They say that society moves on a f- pandemic two ways. Either the, the virus is eradicated, didn't happen, or people just go, we're over it. Yeah. We're done. We're going to move on. Take the chance. I'm living my life, right? And that's kind of what happened. We just decided it's over. You guys know COVID still exists, right? Right? But you're here. A year ago, you weren't. It's the same virus. And again, maybe you've had it, you've vaccinated, whatever. But it still exists. But, but we've decided to move on. And what happened is a society, we went full throttle back into it. Hey, let's go, baby. Get the game started. Let's get the stadiums full. Back to concerts. Let's just go, right? Full throttle but with most people running on empty, with their reserves completely depleted, gone, running on empty. I mean, the best way to show you this is in 2020, Jess and I had a seven-year sabbatical schedule that the board graciously gave to me to take a month off of work in the summer, and it was July of 2020 was my month off. (laughs) What a great time to have a sabbatical. (laughs) And uh, we we had been closed down uh, we were literally reopening when I was on sabbatical, um, and we had uh, a connection to stay at a place in Orlando for a week, and then we were traveling to the Panhandle of Florida for another week, so we're spending two weeks in Florida, and I flew my entire family round trip for $800. I landed in Orlando, stacked planes on the runway, baggage carts just sitting there. It was a ghost town. Disney was closed. It was the best Orlando trip I ever had. (laughs) Dad, can we go to Disney? Sorry, kids, it's closed. (laughs) All you got is the pool. Ghost town, right? I rented a car, an SUV for two weeks for under $300. Now you can't even get a rental car. 
Now you can't find an Airbnb, right? Completely packed. And it's crazy, 2020, right? The prices of Airbnbs, rental cars, airfare, all of it, right? Through the roof. It's called supply and demand. 2020, demand was low. 2022, demand is high, so you're paying a premium for it, right? I paid double what I paid in 2020 for my vacation this year. Why? Because here's what most people think. A vacation will fix it. I just need to get away. I just need a break. And it it does help to some extent, but guess what, right? You know, when you get back from vacation, what's waiting on you? Life, your life, reality. The reality of what you are going through. The reality, a vacation can't fix it because listen, a vacation wasn't designed to fill your soul. And what's been depleted are the reserves of your soul. Your soul is thirsty. Your soul is desiring for the power, the supernatural strength that's available to us. And a vacation cannot fill an empty soul. Only Jesus can. And you better fill it before it's too late. Camels are unique in the fact that they can literally go thousands of miles through desert without water. They have some reserves. But here's the thing that's unique about camels is that unlike a horse, where a horse will will begin to show signs of tiring out, saying, hey, I'm getting tired, I'm slowing down, camels will just go until they literally collapse and die if you don't know how to handle it. And that's what happens, that's what I really think of burnout. Like when your soul's depleted and you're not refilling it, we call it burnout, right? You just burn out. And we've seen this happen in our society at a rate that we've never seen before. We are, again, remarkably resilient people where we can rally to the challenge, but like camels, it can evaporate in a moment. And maybe you've seen it. The faithful mom who loved her kids, committed to her family, does everything she could for her family, all of a sudden has this unexpected affair and leaves her family behind. The pastor who has been faithful to the call of God for years, preaching the call of God, teaching scripture, and all of a sudden literally just burns out, quits, and doesn't just quit the church, quits on God. I have friends. The coworker who seemed like everything was good, and you show up for work and they say, they took their life this weekend. And you go, suicide, all-time highs. Mental health crisis, all-time highs, right? There's something that's going on. Why is this happening? You see, again, when we go through a crisis, we, we have to tap into reserves to get through it. But when you run through all of your reserves without replenishing them, you're just done. It's over, you quit. You're on the side of the road in a desolate place with nothing left in your tank and we quit, we abandon the fight, we've been fighting and we abandon the fight to go find relief. Because we all need relief. We're seeking relief, we're seeking peace, we're seeking an escape and the vacation didn't fix it and what else you're trying doesn't fix it and the key is to replenish your reserves in the right place before they run out. You can't be the push it to the limit people with your soul. There's too much at risk. You gotta start noticing, man, I'm, I'm a little more irritable. I'm a little bit more short fused, right? Like another statistic that's alarming that's showing this in society is that in 2019, the amount of airline disturbances they would have, I'm not talking about turbulence, I'm talking about passenger disturbances, average globally 10 a month, 10 a month. In 2021, with fewer flights, 500 a month. Why? People are over it. They're, they're depleted, right? right? It, it, things that used to not tick you off just start ticking you off, right? You're at Kroger, you're in a hurry, you gotta go. It's 10 items or less, lady. You have 13. Move it, you know, someone should talk to her, right? Like we just lose it, someone cuts you off, you're, "Ah, what? It's, it's, It's a problem, right? We're seeing this happen. And the key is to replenish before you run out. So I wanna ask you a question. Where do you run for relief? 
When you reach the point where you go, I'm on fumes here, where do you run for relief? If you were to really evaluate yourself today, what would you say where you're at right now this morning, where you're at watching, right? What is the current level of fuel in your tank? If normal is 100%, and Jesus said he came to give us life and life to the full, so I, I take him at his word, and then it doesn't mean that you don't lose a little fuel, but you come back up. Come down some, come back up. But if normal is 100%, what percent would you say you were at? What if another major crisis hit tomorrow? What if all of a sudden a new strand arises, it's resistant to everything we've ever done, then they say, lock it back down. Kids are going home, you're schooling them again, you're working from home, everything's shutting down, you're back to quarantine. Come on, somebody just say, don't even say that, don't ever say that again. If that happened, could you do it? What if it's not a global pandemic again? What happens when your work calls and says, hey, we're, we're cutting your department, you're laid off? What would happen if, if something hit, a crisis hit, a, a health crisis, something challenging that you're not expecting hit? What if, what if all of a sudden your home was, was burnt down and, and everything you owned was gone? Could you, could you rally? Could you overcome? Could you get through it? And again, most of us have come out of this pandemic, we've rallied, we've depleted our reserves, and we've gone full throttle back into life, running on empty full speed on empty. We're in no condition for another pandemic. We're in no condition to face a crisis personally, let alone the attacks of our enemy. If you don't remember, you have an, in, an, an adversary who, who is against you, who's, who's looking for his chance, and don't think he's not wise to what's happening in our world. That's why we're seeing what we're seeing. That's why we're seeing people who I, could, I, can't, I never in a million years would have thought they'd done. Why? Because the enemy knows how to get them. He knows how to get you. First Peter says, watch out. You better stay alert. Keep your head on a swivel. Your enemy, a great enemy at that. Bible's not, say he's a weak one. Now he's defeated. You have power through Jesus to defeat supernatural power, but he's still wise it says he prowls around looking for his opportunity to devour you. Prowling, waiting to pounce. And there's been no greater time probably in recent human history where people have been more susceptible to his attacks. We've stacked trauma on top of trauma, stress on top of stress, and an empty soul that encounters stress, listen, always goes looking for relief. And if the enemy's there, and he knows your weakness, and in your moment of weakness, you know what he's gonna do? He's gonna dangle that carrot. He's gonna say, this'll help. This'll work. Where are you going? Right now, I really want you to think about this. Where are you going to refuel? What do you do? Where do you go? What source are you running to? You get on these toll, tollways and toll pikes, and, they have oasis, they're called oasis, and they're rest stops, right, where you can refuel. You don't want to get off a tollway, you got to pay to get off, pay to get back on, so they put specific rest areas there that you can get it. When you're on a journey, there's strategically placed rest areas along the way, knowing that there's going to be times where you got to pull off and refuel. And so when stress gets high, you feel like your tank's on empty, I really want you to think about where are you going to refuel? What's filling you up? What are you running to? Today I titled this message, You Better Consider the Source. You're gonna run to something. You have to. You're depleted, you're empty. You gotta fill up somehow. Where are you running? Who are you going to? Consider the source. God's people were coming out of Egypt. You talk about a journey, <laughs> 40 years in the desert, Two million people. Moses is leading these people. They saw miracle after miracle. I mean, literally, these people walked through the Red Sea on dry ground. Right? 
And yet, time and time again, they would go back to their old ways. In fact, in Numbers 14.4, the journey was difficult. Probably wasn't a global pandemic. (laughs) Probably wasn't the same problems that you're facing today, but they're facing difficulties, and this is what they say. They they said to each other, "We we should choose a different leader, and we should go back to Egypt. What? You just walk through the Red Sea. One, it's going to be hard to go back because I don't think God's going to part it so you can go back. But, but, but why would you ever want to do that? Why would they want to go back to bondage? They were, they were enslaved. They were driven to the point of death, many of them dying because of the brutal labor that they were doing. Enslaved. Why would you go back to bondage when freedom is available. Freedom was waiting for them. And literally, why would you go back to death when God's trying to lead you to life? But for us today, we face the same choice. You have the same test, right? You come in, Jesus is good, life's good, life's not good, I should just go back. I'm just gonna go back. Because it works for a little bit. Bondage is, sin works for a little bit, right? God's offered you salvation, And today, many of you have experienced salvation, but because of the trauma, because of what you've been through, you've gone back to sin. Sin has become the source that you're trying to fill your soul with. It doesn't work. It will never work. James 1.14 says this. Temptation comes from our own desires. He's telling them God's never going to tempt you. He doesn't dangle things to try to entice you and try to see if you'll pass the the test. That's not what God does. Our own desires entice us and drag us away. These desires, if you allow them to, will give birth to sinful actions. And sin, when allowed to grow, it brings birth to death. Sin always leads to death. Sin always leads to destruction. Sin pr- always overpromises and underdelivers. It's just what it does. And sin's fun for a while, right? There is an escape. When you drink and you get drunk and you escape, you escape for a half hour, an hour. Then you go to bed and wake up with a headache <laughs> and your life's waiting on you doesn't work. It works for a moment, and then it's gone. Listen to me. I'm not preaching an alcohol sermon today, but if you use alcohol to escape reality, then it's sinful. I don't, I I just enjoy a little bit here, and I don't really get, it's just a buzz. It's just, God doesn't want you to have to use anything to escape. He wants you to come to him. Alcohol, pornography, Food, working more, right? We, we try to go to other things to fill a void that only God can fill. And sin, listen, says don't, don't, don't think you can outsmart God. God cannot be mocked, scripture says. Whatever you sow, you will reap. Whatever is done in dark will eventually come into the light. It's just the reality of sin. You can't escape its consequences. You can delay them sometimes, but believe me, they will come. And listen to you, it's back to school this week. My kids set an alarm clock for the first time in a few months, right? Trying to teach them a little more independence, get up on your own, you know, get going, you know. And, and so alarm clocks are going off. It's back to school. We're back into our routine. And listen to me, today, some of you, this is God's wake-up call. He said, stay alert. You better watch out. The devil, he's prowling, he's waiting to pounce. And for you, thank God, it's not too late. The alarm is sounding. Stop. Quit. Quit Quit going there. Quit doing that. Quit going into that relationship. Don't do that. Don't, don't indulge in that anymore. You got to stop. And this is your alarm clock this morning. God brought you here. You're watching. And he's saying, don't hit snooze on sin anymore. It will It will ruin you. It will destroy you. That's what it does. Yet many people, when they run for relief, when they look to fill their soul, they run to sin. 
and your thirsty soul will never be satisfied with sin. It will never work. Jeremiah 2, 12 through 13, God's people again had this pattern, following God, going back to their old ways, following God, back to their old ways. He says, my people committed two sins. They have forsaken me. And look how he describes himself, the spring of living water. The spring of living water. The spring that brings life, that quenches the thirst of your soul. It says, and then they have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns at that, that cannot hold water. What he's saying is, is that the living water is the only thing that can satisfy your soul, but we've forsaken him and we've tried to fill our lives with things that don't even hold water. And we've all seen people do this. We've all seen people chase things that think they will fill their tank. And it's not even always sinful. Material possessions, notoriety, promotion at work, a a newer house. uh, And here's what I think. You see, an idol is anything that we go to before God, anything that we put before God. It's, It's what we call an idol. And one of the greatest idols of our, of our day is our children. And they become our little idols. And we put them in every little thing that we can. Get them on this team. I'm going to get them in this. And you have the, the luxury, the finances to do that. And we, we start chasing what Solomon was like, the wind. Thinking it will fill us up. And if our kids get this and our kids have that, then we'll be happy and and we get ourselves just distracted and busy enough that we really don't have to tend to all the junk that's happening in our marriage. Because you're busy with him and I'm busy with her and we pass like ships in the night. And we fill our lives with all of these things that never satisfy our soul. And what happens is, is when we do this, it's the wrong fuel. It burns off too quick. It, it doesn't last. It, it, and it leads to disappointment. We think it's going to work, and then we're disappointed. And disappointment, when it's left and not remedied, right, it leads to disillusionment. And we're, we don't even have our bearings. We're, we're, we're seeking after wrong things. We don't have a, a perspective on reality. And then all of a sudden, that leads to depression. And when you stack disappointment and disillusionment, and we find ourselves in depression, it literally suffocates the life out of your soul and you quit and you tap out because you're seeking the wrong source and so we have to seek the source that satisfies our soul this morning I hope you will consider the source of your life Ezekiel 47 says he is the source of life God is a river of life he gets a vision And he sees the temple of God, and it's just a river of life. What I love about a river is it never stops moving. It doesn't lose momentum. It's always moving. It's always providing what we need. And that is the source of life. That's who he is. There's no limit to his power. If you will go to him, if you will seek him as your source, he will continually flow into you. Jesus himself in John 7 said on the last day, the climax of the festival, right? All these people were gathered and Jesus stood and he shouted to the crowds. Get this picture, a crowd of people. There's loud, there's movement. And Jesus has to raise his voice to get their attention. And so he shouts to the crowds and what does he want to tell them? What is the one thing he wants to leave all these people with? And he says this, anyone who is thirsty, Jesus knew they were all thirsty. He said, you can come to me and you may go well what do I got to do to come to him he said well I got that covered too you can come to me anyone who believes what's the qualification to come just believing he is who he said he is that he is the source of life he says you can come to me and you can drink and he says for the scriptures declare right he says this riving Rivers of living water flow from my heart to you. He wants to be your source so bad, but he will never make you seek him. He'll never make you 
seek him as the source of your life. He always gives you free will to choose the source. Today, consider the source. Is your source working? Is what you're running to filling the soul? Is it satisfying you? Because here's the reality, and the band's coming. God wants to flow into you because he wants to flow through you. Think about this. If your only purpose was to come into a saving knowledge of Jesus, to get saved, right? Why would God, not when you get saved, go, all right, come on home? If the purpose was just eternal life for you, salvation for you, as soon as you got saved, he would just call you home. Why? He's not a, he's a good God. He wouldn't make his children suffer for no reason. But Jesus guaranteed suffering in this life. It's a part of life. Why? Because God has a greater purpose for you than just you. That God wants to be your river of life. Why? So he can fill you up so that you can flow into others. Listen, you cannot do what God's called you to do. You can't fulfill the commission, the commandment to love him, to love others as you love yourself. You can only love someone else out of the overflow of his love in you. It's not possible any other way. You wanna grow in your relationship, you wanna grow in your love for your spouse, you better go to the source. Supernatural strength. It's not natural to love somebody who's not being nice to you. It's not natural to love somebody who's got an attitude. But a supernatural source, a river of life that always is flowing, that's always available, supernatural. It's not always natural to have peace in the midst of all hell breaking loose in your life. But there's supernatural strength available. If you seek the right source. Psalm 39 said he is the fountain of life. Consider the source. Where are you running? You're gonna run somewhere. You're running somewhere right now. Where are you running? All right, what do I need to do? What's the first step to replenish your soul? What do you gotta do first thing first? It's very simple. You gotta refill your tank. You gotta choose the right source. You're choosing the wrong one, you gotta start choosing the right one. It's a choice, I can't make you do it. I can hoot and holler, clap my hands, raise my voice, preach it down. I think I've been doing a decent job of that today, but, uh, but that doesn't matter. When you leave here, guess what? Life's waiting for you. Kids are waiting for you. What source are you gonna seek tomorrow? He's available. You gotta choose the right source. Three ways to do that. First, some of you, you need to repent from sin. Isaiah 59, one through two, surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save you. He is available. It's not like he's not there, he's there, right? Nor is ear too dull to hear, he'll hear you, but what, your iniquities, your sin have separated you from God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. Sin always separates, it's what it does. Sin is divisive. It brings destruction. It, it takes you from God's path of life. It leads you on a different path. Sin separates. And so scripture tells God's people all the time, what do you do when you've drifted and you acknowledge, I've drifted. I'm seeking a source. I'm drifting to sin. Sin has become the source of my relief in my life. You have to repent. And we don't like to preach repentance very often. It means you own your stuff. You own it. God, I'm sorry. I've been seeking something else. Someone else and I repent, it means to literally turn, turn about face one, God, I'm coming back to you. I'm seeking you as a source. Some of you, you've allowed sin to be the source of your life. You know that it is, you're seeking it. It's a part of your routine. You've, you've, uh, you've just rationalized it, you've excused it. And today God's saying, you gotta repent. How many of you are thankful that Jesus bridged the gap of, that separates you from him, right? That sin does, it separates. There was no way for you to come back except through the death of Jesus Christ. And Jesus paid, sacrificially died for your sin. And the cross of Jesus Christ built a bridge so that any time you want, you can go, God, I want to come home. And he goes, come on home. What, just as I am, just as you are. Even with all this, even with what I did, even what I said, come on home. We'll, heal, we'll handle it. Come home first. Repent of your sin. Second thing, some of you, you need to return to relationship. Revelations 2 Prophetically speaking, 
to the church in Ephesus, a church that was doing great things, seeing God do great things in, the, in their midst, in their community. And he says, but I do have this one complaint against you. You don't love me or each other as you did at first, both of those together. <laughs> and he says this, just look, you gotta look how far you've fallen. Look how far you've fallen. Turn back to me, return to the relationship we once had. Do the works that you did at first. And he's not talking about like works of serving and all that stuff. He's talking about the works you did to have a relationship. How many of you remember when you started dating your spouse, right? <laughs> it was, come on, you put in more work. You just did, right? You called, come on, if you're old like me, you wrote letters, right? You stayed up on the phone. When texting became available, you text, you just, you went on dates, all you did what you had to do, right? Think about when you first met Jesus. Think about when you first, and that's what he's telling his people. He said, man, look how far you've fallen from where we were when we were in relationship, when I was your source, when I was your only source. So for some of you, it's just returning to relationship. I got to get back into my relationship with God, back to what I did at first. And the last thing is remain in Christ. You got to repent. If you're in sin, repent. If you're out of relationship and it's not a priority in your life, you're not seeking the source, return to relationship. And then you got to remain in him. Because it's easy, to, it's easy to say sorry. It's easy to make a commitment. But come on, we've been talking about reading the word daily. You having a personal relationship daily. Listen, church is important. I'm telling you what, this is an oasis in your week. This is where you can veer off your week, come to a place where you can worship, feel the presence of God, be encouraged in community, serve, give of yourself, be a part of something bigger than you. Because here's the thing, you can't, uh, you can't acquire, you can't consume, you can't exercise your way to fulfillment, but you can serve your way to it. You can give yourself to it. Why? Because when you pour out yourself for his kingdom, you know what he does? He pours into you. So you remain. You do what you know to do. It's easy to do it here in a moment. This is a great pit stop on the way, but you better refuel tomorrow and Tuesday. And so you have to establish for yourself a personal relationship where you are remaining in Christ. Jesus says, I am the vine. You're just a branch. You remain in me. I in them. You will produce fruit. You will have an overflow of the Spirit of God in your life if you will remain in Him. And then He makes you another promise. But if you don't, you will do nothing. You won't be able to do anything daily in the word. That's why I tell you here every week, you got to get in a group on a team, in a group on the team. Why? Not because we need you. You need it. It's a way that you remain. It's accountability. It's a system that you're involving in your life, that you're committing to in your life that keeps you in him. Where Christ, where you're in Christ-centered environments throughout your week, getting in a life group, doing life with people, serving, giving of your best. Man, this is what it looks like to remain. Repent if you need to. Don't hit snooze again. It's not too late yet. There's still grace. There's still hope. Repent. Some of you got to return. You've drifted from where you used to be. You've been seeking other sources. Today, he says, let me be your source again. Let me fill you up. Remain in me. Remain in me. In John chapter 4, Jesus is launching his public ministry. Pretty big moment. He'd been with his disciples. He'd been waiting to kind of announce who he is. And he goes and meets this Samaritan woman out of well. She's coming in the middle of the day. And there's scholars that debate this. But... She didn't come when the rest of the women came because she was ashamed of her past. So she came in the middle of the day and Jesus is there. He sends his disciples on and it's just him and her. And This Jewish man is talking to this Samaritan woman and it's just not typical. It's not what should happen. And Jesus has this conversation with her and essentially they're at this well and she's going there to get water. And he says, listen, 
I'm the well of life. And if you'll drink of me, you won't ever thirst again. And then he calls out some of the stuff that she was doing, relationships she had had that I think that she was trying to fill a void in her life that only God could fill. And he says, and if you'll just drink of me, if you'll just taste and see, the Lord is good. I'll fill your tank. I never run out. You don't have to run on empty, friend. Sure, there's going to be seasons, there's going to be times, but friend, you can tap into a source that is the river of life that never stops flowing, that's always available anytime you need it. Would you stand with me today? I want you to do just that. We're going to tap in to the source. Holy Spirit, your word has been preached. And I pray right now that it would fall on hearts and minds that are ready to receive and to respond. So Holy Spirit, we invite you to come. We acknowledge today you are the source of life. We can experience life and life at its fullest if we will seek the right source. So today, God, we repent of any sin in our life. We take steps to return to you, to turn back to you. In spirit, we pray that you would help us to remain in you. In Jesus' name, amen.